2,000 pounds lost every single week. A Michelin-starred chef on the brink of losing everything. And a restaurant that's gone from local legend to total disaster. Welcome to Rococo, once the crown jewel of King's Lynn seaside dining scene. When acclaimed chef Nick Anderson first opened its doors in 1991, success seemed guaranteed. But after moving away for a decade, his return should have been triumphant. Instead, it became a nightmare. Now, with his restaurant hemorrhaging money and his family's home above the failing business at risk, Nick has one last hope, Gordon Ramsay. But Gordon's about to discover that behind Rococo's elegant facade lies a kitchen nightmare that even he might not be able to fix. I'm reasonably confident he's not going to sort of put his fork down and go, that's disgusting or minging or anything like that. I'm fairly confident that my food will, will stand the test. Ramsay arrives in the heart of King's Lynn, where Rococo sits nestled among the market town's charming streets. Making his way through the narrow entrance, he finds a somewhat nervous-looking Nick in the cramped kitchen preparing for lunch service. After exchanging greetings, Ramsay tells Nick he'll see him after lunch as he wants to try the food to get an accurate picture of the restaurant's woes. As Gordon heads back to the front of the restaurant, he realizes what should be a bustling Saturday reveals a troubling sight. Not a single customer in the dining room. Gordon settles onto a worn-out sofa in the awkwardly placed front entrance that looks more like something out of someone's home than a restaurant. As he studies the menu, the first hint of the restaurant's problems comes when waiter Lawrence approaches him to take his drink order, giving Gordon a taste of the excellent service standards that Nick seems so proud of. Ice? Um, is it cold? With ice it will be. And the orange juice is already chilled, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is it fridged? Yeah. Gordon calls Lawrence a smartass. Already, the visit is off to a rocky start. Following that, Gordon decides to get right down to business scanning the menu with a critical eye. But something catches his attention immediately. The pan-fried scallops description looks oddly familiar. In fact, it's one of his own recipes, though Nick hasn't bothered to credit the source. Moving on to what should be a simple classic, mushroom and duck egg on toast. It's a dish Gordon particularly enjoys when prepared with restraint and care. Unfortunately, what arrives is anything but simple soggy bread topped with mushrooms that look like they've been dragged through a garden. Another strike. Next comes the moment of truth. The scallops should be spectacular, especially since they're following Gordon's own recipe. Living up to his reputation for cheekiness, Gordon asks Lawrence to inquire about where Nick found inspiration for this particular dish. No answer from the kitchen. The scallops arrive, and Gordon's fears are confirmed. They're rubbery and have clearly been frozen. Nick tries to deny it, but Gordon knows better. Lawrence delivers the final dish and can't seem to help himself, hovering by the table, eager to hear Gordon's verdict. You're like a hemorrhoid in my asshole, you know that? Can I just sit and enjoy, or try to enjoy, rather than trying to dissect everything I eat? After Lawrence's disastrous attempt at service, the duck dish that arrives next only adds to Gordon's frustration. While the meat itself is perfectly cooked, an overpoweringly sweet sauce ruins the entire plate. The price tag is shocking too, even by London standards. It's clear this flashy approach isn't working. Back in the kitchen, Gordon delivers his verdict. Painful. Sure, Nick found success in the 90s, but now he's stuck in the past, cooking to please himself rather than his customers. Nick seems stunned by the barrage of criticism, but tries to maintain a tough exterior. Yeah. I'm a big boy. I'm not a 20-year-old. I'm not going to cry. I'm 40, so yeah. bring it on. Behind Nick's bravado lies quite a story. His previous venture, the highly regarded Crown Hotel in Affluent Wells, had earned him multiple awards, entries in the Good Food Guides, and even a Michelin star for three consecutive years. But when Nick and his investors had a falling out, everything crumbled. The restaurant closed, bankruptcy loomed, and the timing couldn't have been worse. He just learned his wife Susanna was pregnant. Gordon decides to get the locals' perspective on Rococo. The verdict is clear. It's simply too expensive for this modest market town. Gordon agrees, adding that both the menu and service feel stuffy and outdated. 
Ready to observe a service, Gordon meets sous chef Tim and asks him about the previous evening's earnings. A shocking zero pounds. When Gordon asks how Tim stays passionate about cooking in such an empty restaurant, Tim shares his unusual source of inspiration. He watches Ready Steady Cook on TV, a popular British cooking show where chefs have to create meals from random ingredients, drawing ideas from what contestants create from their mystery ingredients. You're the first chef I've ever, ever met that's becoming... that's become excited and stimulated on the back of Ready Steady Twat. Clearly unimpressed, Gordon asked Nick to show him the fridges, which are stocked with premium ingredients, all meticulously labeled. When these expensive meats and fish don't sell, the chefs take them home to eat. Great for their dinners, terrible for business. Things get worse when Gordon spots frozen shrimp in the freezer. Nick claims they struggle to get fresh ones, despite being on the coast. Gordon isn't having it, revealing he's already researched the area and knows that's not true. Determined to see the kitchen in action, Gordon has a plan. Fill the dining room by inviting Nick's friends and local business people for a free meal. The service should run smoothly. After all, Nick admits most menu items haven't changed in 12 years. Instead, it's painfully slow as Nick fusses over each plate's complex presentation. Mistakes pile up and dishes sit getting cold at the pass. Gordon watches in frustration as Nick obsesses over unnecessary details instead of getting hot food to hungry customers. Gordon points out what should be obvious. Adding more garnishes and complications doesn't make the food better. It just slows everything down. Despite his earlier tough talk, Nick's facade finally cracks. The chef, who claimed he wouldn't cry, breaks down in tears. The next morning, Gordon arrives with a plan to help Nick move forward. Searching through the restaurant's bookshelves, he finds Nick's collection of cherished mementos. Those yellowing good food guides need to go in the rubbish bin. And though reluctant, Nick agrees and they get chucked in the bin. With the past packed away, it's time to focus on creating new dishes that will bring in customers. Gordon proposes a challenge. Come here, my little fucking Rottweiler. Sorry, shit. You mentioned to me the other day about Ready Steady Twat. Yeah? Oh, no. no, 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 don't look at me like that. A game of Ready Steady Cook with Nick and Tim, who have 20 minutes to create something from basic ingredients. Nick, more comfortable with delicate baby vegetables, finds himself chopping humble leeks and potatoes. The results? Nick presents grilled mackerel with thyme and lemon juice, while Tim creates mackerel fillets with garlic and butter. Nick feels confident his dish is restaurant worthy, but Tim lacks faith in his creation, thinking it doesn't look professional enough. Gordon surprises them both. He tells Tim he's being paranoid, explaining that presentation only matters for 30 seconds because it's the flavor that holds the memory. Nick's dish tastes good, despite forgetting to remove the fish guts, leaving it bitter. But Gordon points out they both missed a golden opportunity. Those leeks and potatoes could have become a hearty, cost-effective soup. They could have turned one course into two, maximizing profits. Nick makes a telling admission. He's not a quick learner and Gordon will likely grow more frustrated with him. Gordon can't understand how the restaurant is staying afloat with such low income. Susanna reveals their harsh reality. They never go out anymore because money is too tight, and Nick is miserable. The only thing keeping them open is a recent investment from friends. If they close now, they'll be stuck with a devastating 100,000 pound debt. Determined to find solutions, Gordon tackles Nick's expensive ingredient habits head on. He takes Nick to meet local fishermen who could supply fresher, cheaper alternatives. The fish tastes excellent, leaving Nick without excuses. That evening, Gordon lets Nick cook his old menu one last time, but critiques every move, questioning each unnecessary addition to every plate. What's the idea behind the two sauces? Resemblance of a pearl necklace I used to give on my girlfriend. Gordon hopes his relentless criticism is finally getting through. Nick is wasting precious time that could be spent serving more customers. The next morning brings more drama. Ramsey arrives for work, but Nick leaves him sitting on the doorstep. Bewildered, Gordon knocks and rings repeatedly, until finally the door opens. Nick confesses he spent the night bawling his eyes out. Gordon softens, telling Nick he has what it takes to turn things around. He wouldn't be here otherwise. 
Gordon's big plan for revamping the restaurant? A complete rebrand, starting with the name. Inspired by St. Margaret's Church across the street, he suggests Maggie's, a friendly alternative to the pretentious Rococo. Nick hates it. Gordon pushes forward anyway. The new menu features simple dishes designed for quick, cost-effective service. As Ramsay walks them through preparation, Nick again voices his hatred for the new name, but falls silent when Gordon asks for alternatives. Gordon's frustration boils over. He tells Nick bluntly that refusing to change means losing everything. He can't understand why Nick seems so reluctant to save his own business. Neither can Susanna, who wonders if pride is keeping Nick from letting go of Rococo. Gordon points out to her that the £100,000 debt should be motivating Nick more, especially with his wife, children, and staff depending on him. Even sous chef Tim is baffled by Nick's resistance. To break through, Gordon takes Nick to his old restaurant, The Crown. There, he shares his own story, how he walked away from his two Michelin-starred restaurant, Aubergine, when his vision clashed with investors. The restaurant struggled after Ramsay left, and walking away was a pivotal moment in his career. He admits he wishes he'd gone back to eat there, to make peace with the past, and encourages Nick to do the same. Walking along the beach, something seems to click. It's time for a fresh start. Relaunch night arrives, and Nick has finally agreed. The restaurant will become Maggie's. Gordon sends the waiters out to drum up business, while the team refreshes the dining room, removing dated sofas to make room for more tables. During the furniture move, Gordon makes a discovery, a black bag stuffed with good food guides that Nick sneaked back from the trash. Gordon makes him throw them out again. With the dining room refreshed, they're ready for service with 44 bookings. Gordon makes a bold promise. If they get 10 more covers to fill the restaurant, he'll run naked around the cemetery. The new menu is streamlined and simple. Gordon hopes Nick can keep his cool and stay on track. Orders start flowing in, and food leaves the kitchen quickly. But old habits die hard. Nick still fiddles with the food, wasting time. Then disaster strikes. A ticket mix-up leads to him cooking one table's order twice. After a brief panic, Nick takes control and gets the service back on track. He's working well with Tim, and customers are delighted with both the food and the prices. Many promise to return. They've taken 2,500 pounds in an evening, and Nick is feeling good about the future. He's finally understanding that while Rococo had no audience, Maggie's could become a local favorite. Gordon's still nervous that there's no excitement from Nick, but he remains hopeful. Seven weeks later, Gordon returns to check progress. The restaurant is bustling, with Nick hard at work in the kitchen. The turnaround is impressive. Weekly turnover now averages 5,000 pounds, with their best week hitting 8,000 pounds. Gordon requests a table in the busy dining room and orders an intriguing combination. Local soul and an onion budgie. The later's presence on the menu puzzling him. But the budgie provides a delicious surprise. When Lawrence brings out the soul, Gordon notes approvingly that the waiter hasn't asked how the food is. Clearly, he's learned his lesson. The fish is exactly what Gordon hoped for. Simple, rustic, and full of great flavors. He compliments Nick, who shares that his passion for cooking has returned. Gordon predicts he'll be making a profit again soon, and Nick reveals he's nearly there. Taxes are paid, and supplier invoices are up to date. Chef Ramsay has one final request. Hey, uh, Timmy, the budget was delicious, by the way. Good. Can I have the recipe, please? No. You tight little fucker. Gordon tells Nick not to change, and to accept that success is measured by the buzz in the dining room. He's amazed by Nick's transformation, and hopes this remarkable turnaround continues. Gordon's visit to Rococo took place in July 2006. By the time the episode aired in November that year, the newly named Maggie's was thriving, proof that sometimes letting go of the past is the key to future success. In a newspaper article, Nick revealed that takings had continued to soar after Gordon's visit, and the upcoming Christmas season was already looking busy. And that wasn't the only good news. Within a year, Maggie's had earned an award from Nick's favorite publication, The Good Food Guide. We're sure he managed to find a place for a copy on one of those bookcases that Gordon made him empty twice over. 
Nick was grateful for Gordon's advice and told the local reporter that he had been charming, despite his sometimes angry outbursts, which he felt were really just for the camera. Nick had reached out to the celebrity chef when the restaurant's future looked very bleak, and he could see that the visit had helped turn the business around. Ultimately, Ramsey's assistance enabled Nick to pay off many of his debts and get on top of his finances. Until it all went wrong again. In September 2007, Nick and Susanna were hit with a large utility bill they could not pay. As they didn't own the restaurant building, they could not borrow against it. And when they once again fell behind with tax payments, they were threatened with the removal of property from the restaurant. The couple were forced to file for bankruptcy. Maggie shut its doors on September 26, 2007, though Nick assured locals that the closure was temporary. He told them that two customers had set up a new company that would reopen the restaurant. It's safe to assume that was the same business people who had bailed him out prior to Ramsey's visit. In June of the next year, Tony and Karen Lombardi opened a new restaurant, Luigi's, in the building, but sadly the venture only lasted a couple of months. In 2010, the building was taken over by Market Bistro and given a sleek and modern makeover. The walls had a lick of dark gray paint, and the chairs and tables were given a more contemporary update. The restaurant was listed in the Michelin Guide, but only received a disappointing 3.8 out of 5 rating on Yelp. It remained open until 2020, when it went into administration owing £176,000 in debts. In 2023, the owners of the successful local restaurant, Mem's Kitchen, took over the lease to open a second venue, which is still there today. Reviews rated an astounding 4.8 out of 5, and it was recently named King Lin's Restaurant of the Year, an award that proudly displays in the entranceway. After Maggie's closed, Nick moved to Oxfordshire and took a role as head chef at highly regarded gastropub, The Bell at Hampton Poyle. Around this time, he sadly split up with his wife Susanna, and the couple later went on to divorce. We don't have any further updates on her, or on cheeky waiter Lawrence and talented sous chef Tim. Nick's professional life was improving, as The Bell became a popular haunt for foodies, who were prepared to venture out of the city to sample his dishes. The kitchen team needed to grow, and the owners employed an ambitious young chef called Kate, who had worked in a Michelin-starred restaurant nearby. She went into the bell for a trial, and a few years later found herself married to head chef Nick. She became the second Mrs. Anderson in 2015. The pair became a force to be reckoned with in the kitchen, bringing in customers from across the country, and serving food usually found in trendy London eateries. They were soon headhunted by a pair of successful restaurateurs who had purchased a failing pub nearby, which they were planning to rename the Boxing Hare. In 2017, Nick and his new wife were offered their dream role, to take over the kitchens at the pub and create an entirely new menu together. Before long, the Boxing Hare was developing an excellent reputation for its fresh and flexible fine dining menu, which includes quick lunch dishes and sumptuous evening meals. It's a popular spot with celebrities, and Nick posted a proud picture with his wife's childhood idol, David Beckham, who popped in for lunch with his family a couple of years ago. Nick is still the head chef at The Boxing Hair, which receives outstanding reviews and is rated 4.5 out of 5 on TripAdvisor. The food looks delicious with a distinctly modern presentation. Even Chef Ramsay couldn't call Nick's current menu outdated. And it's also not pretentious. As well as premium cuts of meat and delicate souffles, Nick offers everything from perfect pies to traditional British Sunday roast dinners for his customers. And the restaurant tries hard to accommodate walk-ins to encourage locals to drop by. From his online presence, it's clear that Nick loves his job, his food, his family, and spending time with his wife. It's great to see him looking so happy. As for his memories of his brush with fame during Kitchen Nightmares, well, unfortunately, they don't seem to be so positive. When he shares reminders of the show on Facebook, he refers to Gordon's visit as still a nightmare in his mind. Viewers were actually very sympathetic towards Nick, and he is widely seen as a competent chef who had just lost touch with his customers and the market. In fact, his talent as a chef may explain why Ramsay appeared to be so tough on him. He was holding him to the highest standards because he was capable of reaching them. And he went down in history as the only chef who has gotten away with leaving a bewildered Gordon Ramsay sitting on his doorstep. 
We're sorry that the episode appears to be a reminder of a very difficult time in his life, but are happy to see that he's doing so well now, and wish him well for the future.